The wait is over. The releases are here. And like every year, my predictions were, let's just say, hit or miss. The Milgausters continued. Yachtmaster in titanium. The Explorer sized up. The GMT in two-tone on a Jubilee. The GMT in full gold on a Jubilee. The Black Bay and the Next Generation 36 and 41 on a Jubilee bracelet. And then, well, there's stuff like this. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> so pour something to drink, kick back, and let's go in depth on Rolex and Tudor and their releases of the year. It was clearly a massive array of releases this year, some surprising, others disappointing. But this is not our first rodeo, we know how this works. The huge peak in interest, the slow come down, the regret, the remorse, the bitterness, and then clarity. And looking at the playing field, this has been one of the best releases we've seen in a while. Very much like the teaser trailer, there was a lot of diversity and a lot of thought put into the collections. So the aim of this video is to cover the wide selection of the most significant watches, but throughout the course of the year I will also cover some of the individual pieces more methodically in their own videos. So bear that in mind that this video is going to be more of a blanketed discussion around them, but in the future I will discuss them separately. So let's begin by discussing Tudor and the Black Bay. Surprisingly, more Black Bays this year. The most significant of this series has to be the Black Bay now with the certified Metas movement, reintroduced with a red burgundy bezel on a Jubilee bracelet. On a watchmaking front, it's great to see Tudor trying to push their ability and to fall in line with the standards of Metas certification. As most of us know, the most popular brand here that qualifies for that certification is Omega, and Tudor is definitely trying to compete with that name. We'll spend more time talking about the aesthetic changes on the case and the externals in a moment, but with the gilt dial, it's great to see two lines of text, and it's excellent to see this red bezel again, calling back to the 2012 first edition Heritage Black Bay. It's also a nice touch seeing this watch on a Jubilee bracelet, and the fact that it keeps its 41mm size is going to please a lot of people. It's also important to notice that they have slimmed down these cases, so the slab-sided case thickness is dwindling. But the piece that's getting the most praise and the most coverage is the Black Bay 54. And it's an interesting one because, as most of us know, the gilt dial Black Bay 58, I think most of us would agree it's the most successful watch that Tudor has ever produced in all of their collections. This model aims to call back to the very first Tudor Submariner in size, proportion and characteristics. From a solid black bezel with no hash marks, no red triangle, even period correct script and wider baton markers at every 5 minute point. Something that makes me very happy is that we no longer have a matte dial but a gloss gilt dial with gold lettering, gold minute marks, gold surrounds and I believe even the font on this dial was adjusted ever so slightly. And then as to the exterior, the obvious change from 39 to 37 millimeters, but the watch still keeps a lot of great presence on the wrist owing to the fact that the lugs are nice and thick. And throughout this collection what is commonplace now is a smaller crown with better knurling and more serrations on the bezel, no longer do we have coin edges. I also really appreciate the fact that this watch is still using 20mm wide lugs and the clasp is using T-fit. Still not a fan of the rivet bracelet though. Now as much as I'm not a fan of the Black Bay collection, for those who don't know, this is my favourite interpretation of a gilt dial Black Bay that I've ever seen and I think it does and overdoes everything that the 58, the original one, did. Barring the fact that this watch does not have a rose logo or a smiling self-winding on the dial, which very important and I think is a missed opportunity, they could use chronometer officially certified in the same way. It's really gorgeous because it nails the proportions. And I think for those who have slimmer wrists, they're going to love it. It's going to just fill in all the criteria that they've wanted out of a dive watch in a smaller size. 100% this is a unisex watch. And when we look at the Pelagos, which is a far more modern contemporary take of their collection, the Black Bay always pulling from its classic inspirations, this being a near one-to-one -one faithful recreation of that very first reference. So I have no doubt that they're going to sell extremely well and we're going to have to wait a good few years before they're available in mass. But it's definitely one of my favorite releases looking at the entire catalog because it's faithful, it's original, it's timeless. The GMT was given a white, an opaline dial, which calls back to the 6542 Albino, a very, very rare model. You just don't see them today. And I like the fact that they're still pulling that inspiration from their past catalog. Believe it or not, I was going to make a video about this exact subject a few months ago. The next logical step forward will be to see the GMT put into a smaller case. I'll be sure to do a more in-depth design review at a later stage. And then to the steel bezel Black Bay, the 36, the 41 on a Jubilee bracelet. 
I cannot believe I, I got it, like 100%, I called it. And many are saying that I got inside information about this, I absolutely didn't. This was just looking at their catalog, piecing a few things together. I feel very much like how I said in the video that the Steel Black Bay on a Jubilee is going to be that dress option. A much more formal in design take, and the fact that we are seeing sunbrush dials included is a nice touch. Looking at these simple collections, the Black Bay 54 being the faithful recreation, the GMT and the Metas model being the tool watches, and the steel bezel Black Bays being the formal take. The Tudor Royale also received a few color updates and changes, but this video is going on long enough and I don't think many people are that interested in the watch. So this year's releases from Tudor were both safe and well handled, but let's not forget that this is only the start. We might be seeing a lot more in the coming months. And then over to Rolex, let's start with the discontinued Milgauss. I made a video about a month back discussing this very subject, and since 1954 was the release of this watch, if I remember my numbers right, I expect to see an entire new line given to us next year. It is a sad loss, and I don't believe we will ever see the Z-Blue Milgauss return in the same form again. But it's also a collection that has been around for a long time, and especially judging by how movements have changed so much, how anti-magnetic properties of pieces are so far in advance, it is a piece that's going to need a change, and I expect we're going to see it soon enough. The 40mm Explorer, this was a nice surprise. And I think it's a natural progression forward. I don't think we would have expected this watch to be completely gone from the catalog. As we can see, it's literally a scaled up version of the 36mm, even down to the text on the dial. The only emphasis I appear to see is a more accentuated element at each 5 minute marker, very similar to the 39mm variant. And for those of you out there who might have overspent on a 39mm model just as it was discontinued, you have my sympathies. So the Yachtmaster in titanium was a nice addition. I think it was fairly obvious that we were going to see this watch, judging by the prototype, judging by the machining and the testing we saw on the Challenge Sea Dweller. This model looks like it has amazing 42mm proportions. Judging by the size of its bezel, it's just adding to the watch's overall legibility. Huge plots on its dial, an accentuated minute hand, and the added matte finish on the entire case and bracelet gives it a nice touch. So this watch now encroaches in the Submariner's territory, and ironically we could say it's far more of a professional watch than the Submariner is altogether. From its matte and brushed elements to its thinner case profile and more legible dial arrangement. The reason why this piece appeals to me is because it has this great stealth aspect surrounding it. Even the gloss elements on the bezel, very sparse. This piece is almost entirely matte. And from it, in a way, its design is calling back to models of yesteryear with a tapering case, tapering crown guards. It's a great piece, a great size, and I think many will be happy with it. The GMT in full yellow gold and in two-tone on Jubilee bracelets, this was a complete guess from my end, but I'm so happy that they did it, especially the solid gold variation. And it's a watch that effortlessly calls back to the 1675. Also really like the subtle grey ghosting at the base of the bezel, this is a vintage enthusiast's dream. Now to the two watches that have been spoken about the most. The discontinuation of the Cellini collection, the introduction of the 1908. 1908 being the year that Rolex was established. So they're pulling on the heartstrings and in a way giving us classic interpretation of that original watch. I for one feel like it's a missed opportunity that they got rid of something as effective as a moon phase with, with beautiful elements like meteorite in favor of just a simple time variation. And the more I look at it, there's some good things, don't get me wrong that the 9mm case thickness, the sapphire back. One of my favorite changes is the handset, the fact that they've used that negative space so effectively. But I feel like they code 1159 it. You never go full 1159. I mean this by saying that yes, there are a lot of elements that strongly pull from Rolex's past catalog, and you can see very clearly that it is a Rolex watch, and that this watch, though it is an entirely new collection and brand new, it just doesn't wow. The matte dials chosen might be a reason why, the polished applied elements might be another contributing factor. The sense that there is no depth to this dial, which doesn't necessarily hold your attention at all, might be something else. Look, there's something extremely novel about the fact that they've given us an entirely new collection. The fact that they've given us a clear case back that we can see the movement more appropriately, that the watch is so thin in size and definitely looks like a piece from the 20s and the 30s. But it just doesn't grab that it should. It doesn't have that injection of excitement that it should have. And maybe it's just the first edition and, and the first impressions, you know, haven't really rubbed off as well as we thought. But what do they say that you can't make a second first impression? So. I don't know. This watch in its entirety is a bit of an enigma, and it's clear that they're trying to chase after Patek Philippe and their collection. I believe with a few changes they could make this watch look a little bit more punchy and effective, and the white dial is definitely my favorite of the group. 
But all of that said, the future of this watch is unknown. And to the main event, the anniversary of the Daytona, we now see the 1-2 series. And over the days, the more I've looked at it, the more I feel like this is arguably the best iteration of the modern Daytona that they have ever done. But it doesn't come without flaws though, don't get me wrong. But what's so interesting about this collection that we've seen today is that Rolex is very much looking back at its past. And historically, we know that Rolex doesn't tend to look back over their shoulder. They tend to keep going forward, changing their watches incrementally without necessarily calling back to past designs. This generation of the Daytona almost signifies that they believe the Zenith variation was the best they ever made. Because so much of this watch is Zenith Daytona influenced. Taking a step back and looking at this watch, everything that it's comprised of, it feels like a vintage watch, but done so well. Because they scaled up the dial in size, they made the bezel thinner, visually making it look like a bigger watch. The case has also been modified, the crown guards have been made thicker. The thinner subdials and thinner hour marks makes this watch look bigger in size, but it also looks vintage influenced. I've never really enjoyed the modern day toner and some of the peculiarities in its design, but this looks to be such a modest and reserved update that doesn't call any attention to itself, but manages to almost refresh its entire design. I should also mention that this watch introduces a new movement with a Siloxi hairspring and all sorts of other updates. I think as a design that understands restraint while at the same time beautifying and making it a far more fashionable and beautified watch, it's masterfully done. And I never thought I would say I prefer this generation of the Daytona over the last one. But there are some drawbacks and let's get into that. Rolex's Platinum Daytona with their clear case back feels a bit too much like a people pleasing exercise and a kowtow. Which is a strange thing to say. As most of us know sapphire case backs have been around for decades at this point and Rolex historically is known not to do it. I don't think this should have been a time for them to do it now. It's just not necessary, you know? The thinning out of the batons and subdials decreases the watch's overall legibility yet again. Maybe it's just my eyes that are seeing this, but it looks like they're decreasing the amount of gold used on these dials by about half. The gold surrounds used on the subdials, a lot of that seems to be missing. And the one change that looks aesthetically beautiful, but is just practically wrong, is the surround around the ceramic bezel. For those of you who know, when this gets scratched or dented, it's going to be a nightmare to look at. But as most of us know and can agree with, less than 5% of these watches are ever even going to grace the wrist of enthusiasts. These watches are going to be put into safes, they're never going to see the light of day, which is extremely sad because aesthetically these are some of the most beautiful modern chronographs that I've seen in a long time. So as much as this Daytona was probably my favorite release from Rolex next to the solid gold GMT, it's extremely unfortunate that neither of these watches are actually going to be worn and enjoyed. They are going to be commodities, plain and simple. Amongst the pieces we've discussed, there's been an update to the Sky Dweller, a new color variation, rose gold used for the first time on a full bracelet. The Oyster Perpetual gets what I would call a Petri dish dial, an odd one. The Day Date 36 gets what I would call a puzzling dial with emoticons and stuff. Are we talking about Richard Mille or Rolex? I'm confused. After covering these pieces, there is some brilliant variety here. And I think both brands were able to communicate well enough and reciprocate across the board. And much like how the teaser trailers advertised, extremely diverse across selections. All that said, while everyone has been talking about these releases and the focus has been elsewhere, I picked up a Zenith for the same price as a 39 millimeter Pelagos on the gray market. But that, as they say, is a story for another time. So thank you very much for taking the time to listen to me go in depth about all of these new watches. And I'll see you in the next one. And it's a watch that effortlessly... And it's a watch that effortlessly... Can I get this word right? And it's a watch that effortlessly... And it's a watch that effortlessly... <laughs> and it's a watch that effortlessly... There we go. It's a watch that effortlessly... Damn it. And it's a watch that effortlessly calls back to the 1675.